Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day, it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country. And there is no escaping it. No matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, along with me, Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. Howdy. Listen, I fair warning, you might hear nature sounds today, Tim, which is unlike me. As you know, I'm not one for nature. <laughs> Are you bird but watching today? Is that the deal? It's, it's beautiful out. Oh, and okay. I've got my curtains open, my window open so that I can feel the fresh breeze across my face. And... um I'd like to say it's all about nature, but it really comes down to the fact that I'm tired of $500 a month electric bills because our air conditioner uh, unit sucks to keep my house cool. Oh, so I, I I'm, I'm going Little House on the Prairie style. We just open windows now, Tim. Sure. Why not? I mean, you know, we finally are out of the 90s. We started somewhere in March and uh, with the 90s, and, and now finally we're, we're out of the 90s. So, yeah, go ahead. Celebrate. Open up a window. That's, I don't care. That's what I feel. Yeah, it's beautiful. 70-degree yeah. weather. It's a yeah. gorgeous breeze coming off our scummy pond in the <laughs> oh that, that sounds <laughs> delicious yeah <laughs> pretty, pretty remarkable it's uh, uh you know it is what it is yeah, yeah i'm just thankful that we, you know we've got this beautiful uh, breeze to come through listen we have uh news stories to start off with today tim big news stories lots of news stories this one has been sent to me by the most amount of people okay so i'm gonna read it pilot reports mysterious man with a jet pack flying near planes yeah, I heard that one this week. Yeah. yeah, you don't hear that every day, a JetBlue pilot said. Only in L.A. There is a mystery unfolding in Los Angeles. It wasn't Buzz Lightyear or Robert Downey Jr. in an Iron Man costume, but pilots landing at Los Angeles International Airport this past Sunday reported seeing a man wearing a jet pack flying near their planes. American hmm. Airlines flight 1997 from Philadelphia to L.A. was the first to report in. <sighs> Tower American 1997. We just uh, we just uh, passed a guy in a jetpack. Uh, I'm adding a little uhs because that's what it always <laughs> sounds like when they do their their over the head announcements. It, it does. Yeah. 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 The American Airlines pilot radioed in to air traffic control according to records by LiveATC.net. The air traffic controllers sounded stunned in response and asked the pilot for more details. <laughs> American 1997? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> were they off to your left or your right side, the controller asked. That's the question. The pilot said the man was flying with a jet pack at 3,000 feet and only about 300 yards away from the plane, an Airbus A321. Shortly after that, another pilot reported that he, too, saw a man in a jet pack flying near their plane. We just saw the guy passing us by in a jet pack, the SkyWest pilot told controllers. Other aircraft were then immediately warned to use caution of a man wearing a jet pack flying in the path of planes. You don't hear that every day, a JetBlue pilot told, uh, told the uh, TSA. Only in L.A. The Federal Aviation Administration said that the report was turned over to the Los Angeles police authorities have not found any man with a jet pack. Hmm. And who or what came close to a plane remains a mystery, the FAA says. An investigation is now underway. According to the FAA, reports of unmanned aircraft sightings from pilots, law enforcement personnel, and the general public have increased dramatically, Tim, over the past two years. Really? Yeah. Huh. Huh. Well, I guess unmanned aircraft sightings, there's a lot of those little, uh, uh, what do they call them? 
drones people are zipping around. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 The agency says it receives more than 100 such reports each month if, in fact, the sighting was of a man with a jet pack, it would have been illegal for him to fly in commercial airline airspace or to fly alongside planes. There are some human jet packs in development that can reach altitudes of up to 12,000 feet with price tags of a half million dollars. Oh. That's all, Tim. I'm just saying, my 53rd birthday is coming up in November, and that would be a hell of a gift to get me, buddy. It, it would be. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, uh, except for... I would only fly uh, about nine feet in the air, though, because I don't like heights <laughs> too much. <laughs> but just enough to fly over cars and get to places. It, there's one problem with that, Dave, is that eventually mm-hmm. you would come across a semi, and <laughs> those mm-hmm. are a little higher than, yeah. than nine feet. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, start... Start watching for jetpacks. That'll be the bumper stickers for 2021. <laughs> the size, weight of a person in a jetpack impacting an airplane at the exact wrong spot could potentially bring that airliner down, ABC News contributor and retired Marine Colonel Steve Ganyard said. Oh, that's great. Let's put that out there so that some psycho who might be suicidal and decides he wants to take a bunch of people with him now know that. Good plan. Well, not to mention, Dave, there's another syndrome here, goose syndrome. Yeah. You know, right into the old jet engine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, could you imagine just cooking along in your jet pack and get a face full of goose? Well, no, no, no. I'm talking about you're flying along and then all of a sudden you get sucked into a jet engine. Oh, I know that, but I'm just yeah. saying, could you imagine zipping along in your jet pack? And oh, like, and then getting a face full of goose. Yeah. Face full of goose. It's like that yeah. Fabio video. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> have you seen that? Yes, I have. For those of you that don't know, you <laughs> might remember uh, It's Not Butter Fabio. Mm-hmm. Um was opening up some theme park and he was sitting in the front seat of a roller coaster and as it went down what was it a pigeon or a goose or something flew in front of him and smashed into his face and exploded yeah and then he there's video you can see the pictures didn't he break his nose or something like that he had a his face was all fabulous fabulous nose yeah yeah Yeah. i don't know if it was his blood or if it was the the blood of the the bird the blood of the oh that that's tough that's tough as hell if it was the blood of the bird but i think it was his huh yeah. Maybe it's a little bit of both. It might be. Maybe that's why yeah. we don't hear from him now. He's half bird, half human with the oh. genetically spliced blood entering his bloodstream. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Crazy. Yeah. Hey, uh, good news coming from the House of Mouse, Tim. I was going to say, I was going to add to that story real uh-huh. quick, Dave. Not only jetpacks up there in the sky. Did you hear this past week? Actually, would yeah, it would have been last week. Uh, there was something else in the skies. Uh, to scare every living being out there over these the skies of, I believe it was Arizona in the desert. It was David Blaine reenacting up. Um, did you hear about that 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 stunt? Yeah, I heard that he had something coming up, but I, what exactly was it? I'm, I don't know. I haven't followed David Blaine. He, it's been what ten years since he's been he la- on TV and done anything big. He launched himself. Uh, up with up in the air, literally up in the air with with a ton of uh, helium balloons and went as high as twenty four thousand feet in the air with all these helium balloons to reenact the movie up and then eventually let go of the helium balloons and sailed back down to Earth with a parachute. Uh, he took a, a rebreather up or, or an oxygen uh, rebreather up with him. And uh, eventually, when he, he was only supposed to go 18,000 feet up into the air, and then eventually let the balloons go, and then he was supposed to come back down to Earth with a parachute. And believe it or not, as he came back down to Earth, he stuck the landing perfectly. He actually drifted off about three miles past the landing uh, spot where he was supposed to land, and his team got a little... Uh, a little flustered because they thought he was going to drift off indefinitely. So as in radio communication kind of broke up a little more than it was supposed to. But as he was drifting, uh, they told him, you know, you've got to let go of these balloons. And he was no like, no, no, no. He had an altimeter with him, uh, like a portable altimeter. And he's like, no, 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 I got to get higher. I got to get higher because he's realizing he's breaking records. And he said, I felt like I could breathe just fine up there. In fact, for a while, he didn't put the oxygen in his into his mouth because he was feeling just fine. Um, But he got up to twenty four thousand feet 
he uh, decided at that point, they were telling him, let go of the balloons, let go of the balloons already. Otherwise, he would have drifted too far off from the landing point. Uh, let's go of the balloons. Uh, does his free fall. At that point, as he's doing his free fall, loses communication with his base already. Uh, le- uh, pulls the ripcord on the, on the, um, on the parachute sails in, does a perfect landing, lands on two feet, runs in through the desert. He's just fine. And it was all shot in front of a green screen. Well, I mean, you think that, but no, he was, he was, <laughs> he was absolutely, it was, it was a perfect, I don't know that that's a trick. I mean, he, all these things he does, he he claims are tricks. I, I don't see what the trick is there. I mean, sure. Well, it's it an sounds ex- like he's, he's kind of riding the old, um, escape artist route of calling it a trick but actually it's just a whole new methodology of entertainment like houdini did i think it's like an ex- an, an extreme stunt it's not a trick right you know like him being locked in ice unless you know it depends on what the word trick is maybe the trick is he floated up with those helium balloons but he didn't go as high as he was saying maybe he tricked us in what his actual claims were i don't know it, it all depends on what his definition of the word trick would be. I don't know. They they had the altimeter on board. They had a camera on board that showed you that he actually went up to 24,000 feet. Uh, so there's, I guess, no trick there unless you claim everything was, was rigged to make it look like he was higher than he actually was. But they had cameras focused on him to show you that he actually went up as high as he did. He was, uh, he was uh, you know, he was secured in so that, you know, he, you know, he was hmm. where he was. So, you know, he uh, good on him. Yeah. I don't know what that means to the real world. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I, I know it doesn't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. But hey, he he jumped off a a set of huge helium balloons, and the world's no better for it. But you know what? It, he went higher than those jet jetpack guys, and no plane hit him. Unfortunately. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Wow, David Blaine hater. I did not know this about you. <laughs> well, you know. Oh, my goodness. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's dive back in. The, the House of Mouse has developed a new Haunted Mansion movie because the one with Eddie Murphy sucked. I thought there was a second Haunted Mansion movie already, but maybe I, I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> the Haunted Mansion is finding a new lease on life thanks to uh, Disney. The studio is developing a new film based on the iconic ride from Disney theme parks with screenwriter Katie Dippold set to pen the project. Dippold's credits include the 2016 version of Ghostbusters. I don't know if that would have been the the credit that I would have played in this moment, Tim. Yeah. 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 Dan Lynn and Jonathan Eirich will be producing under the Ride Back banner. Ride Back also produced the live action remake of Disney's Aladdin which was directed by Guy Ritchie. I actually really liked the live action Aladdin. It was one of the few live action movies, Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, I think were really, really well done. I saw Lion King and it depressed the hell out of me. You realize why you need the vibrant colors of Disney animation to tell some stories. That's and I know true. it sounds silly, yeah. no, 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 but it's the same story, but the muted colors, the lack of music and, and upbeat, uh, it just didn't, I don't know, didn't resonate with me. I hear you. The Haunted Mansion was already turned into a film by Disney back in 2003, starring Eddie Murphy and directed by Rob Minkoff. The film was critically panned. Director Guillermo del Toro was attached to reboot the property in 2010, even going as far to co-write the script before the project was abandoned. An animated version that was meant to air on the Disney XD channel ended up being canceled as well. The Haunted Mansion ride features... Of course, a man haunted by 999 ghosts and is one of the most popular rides in Disney World locations worldwide. In addition to inspiring films and TV projects, the ride has also spawned comic book series from Slave Labor Graphics and Marvel Comics. This is not the only Disney ride, which, of course, has inspired a film adaptation, the most popular of which were the Pirates of the Caribbean series. I... uh I wouldn't mind seeing them kind of give it the the once over with the Pirates of the Caribbean flea or f- oh, flea flavor, mm-hmm. you know, because that those first couple movies were brilliant. They, they were, were fun. They were entertaining. I would love to see that. And there's so much rich material there uh, that that you should be able to dig into it and and make a creative movie. But you know, I mean, it. it uh, I I don't know that you have 
other than Guillermo del Toro, I don't know that you have creative heads in Hollywood that could that could tackle that rich source and really get down to the the flavor of, of what you're dealing with there. Why yeah. don't we give M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dong another chance? Oh, because I don't know that he's got creative flavor. <laughs> he's done some decent stuff, you know, that uh, the last couple of, of years he came back with that movie that was kind of half found footage, half acted, and it was uh, where the two kids go to visit their grandparents. Yeah. And that they've been estranged from. It's it was an interesting movie. Then of course he came back with um you know uh Glass and and uh whatever the final movie in that trilogy was, uh on the Unbreakable trilogy. Those were not great. No, um but see either- it seems like the last few years everything is kind of half baked with him. Like he starts out with a great premise and then he it kind of peters out towards the end of the movie, you know. I I yeah. That's that's my problem with him. You know, he he has a great premise going into it, and it's kind of a, a great idea. But then towards the end of the movie, it's kind of like he he needed a nap and he gave up on it and just you know he let somebody else take over the end of the movie. It it, it doesn't seem like he ever finishes anything at the end. Wow, not that you're judging or anything, but no, uh, not at all. No, <laughs> no. Uh, so here's another weird premise. Mm-hmm. The X Files has been resurrected again to Fox. That's right, Tim. The X Files Albuquerque is being developed by Fox mm-hmm. as an animated comedy that centers on misfit agents dealing oh, with wacky no. cases. No. Uh, no. Comedy? According to TV Line, the X Files Albuquerque will center in an office full of misfit agents who investigate X Files cases too wacky, ridiculous or just downright stupid for Mulder and Scully to bother with. They're essentially the X-Files B team. The project received a script and presentation commitment from Fox and will be executive produced by series creator Chris Carter, along with Rocky Russo, Jeremy Sosenko, who will also pen the pilot with Gabe Rotter. Not Gabe Cotter, Tim, Oh, but oh. Gabe Rotter. <laughs> uh, debuting in 93. Can you believe it's been that long since the launch of the X-Files? 1993. I can't. The mm-hmm. X-Files centered on, of course, FBI agents Fox Mulder and Dana Scully, who investigated unsolved paranormal cases. The show ran for nine seasons, ending in 2002 after 202 episodes, before again being revived for a six-episode 10th season in 2016, and then a 10-episode 11th season in 2018. I have a hard time believing it's been that long since those were on. Additionally, the show spawned two films, The X-Files and The X-Files I Want to Believe, and two spinoff series, Millennium and The Lone Gunman. At the time of this article being written, no casting information or proposed premiere window for the X-Files Albuquerque is available. What do you think of that? Do you think we need an animated comedy version of the X-Files? I think they're doing an animated comedy version of Star Trek as well. Well, you you said two things that automatically guarantee this thing isn't going to last a season. Animated comedy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, yeah, but look, the Cleveland show made it four or five seasons. Well, can you can you really bridge X Files and the animated comedy? I I don't. Uh... Why not? They did it with the Ghostbusters cartoons. Mm. There were many iterations. Yeah, but there, I there was depends. already. I guess it depends on how they do it. There was already comedy in Ghostbusters, though. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, although there were some lighthearted moments in X Files, it wasn't like it was wacky nutty to do on on every episode of x files you know I, right. it, it, uh, there were some uh, great moments so god i love that series i got you know what i've got to go back and binge that whole series and just watch it and enjoy it because it was such a, a great series and you know they had a couple of lulls but what series doesn't you yeah, know i yeah. just I got to go back to it. I love that show. Yeah. Uh, speaking of shows, I don't know if you guys know this, but our own Timmy D has a show. It's on Friday nights on the Travel Channel, Paranormal it, Night Shift. In fact, if you've been peeping it lately, you've seen my lovely little mug on it. Uh huh. Finally. There, yep, there <laughs> you go. So Tim's on. He'll be, I think there's like 12 episodes. He's on like eight of them. Mm-hmm. So Tim will be weighing in on some of these strange, creepy cases. That will be uh, popping up. Um, speaking of, I will tell you of strange, creepy cases. The Holzer Files is supposed to launch season two in October. Uh, I'm not sure what point. I think it's around mid-October on Travel Channel. So keep listening to the show for updates on that. I think they've got a couple other things in the works. 
Uh, I can say that I just filmed from home um, another series that uh, is coming out, and they had me uh, on four episodes, I believe. Hmm. So it should be a fun little series uh, that'll be coming out soon um, as well. So just keep listening, and we'll uh, we'll keep filling in and letting you know what you can do to see us. But Paranormal Night Shift with Timmy D. Uh, you could check him out and, and all the great creepy stories that are going on. Um, that's on travel channels Friday nights. So make sure that you tune in and check that out. Now this sounds like a headline ripped right out of the X-Files, Tim. Okay. Cops and villagers flee a businessman's goblins. Villagers and two police officers scurried for cover after they allegedly stumbled on goblins in a businessman's suitcase while searching for poison that allegedly led to the death of several community members. The businessman, Sanderson Bloom Shamashai, who also runs a grinding mill at Lapote Business Center in Deet, is the eye of the storm as he is also being accused of digging a grave of one of his wife's relatives. The businessman, however, has vehemently denied these accusations. A source who spoke to B Metro on condition of anonymity said villagers were up in arms with the businessman after their dogs mysteriously died after getting into his homestead. Worried about that, the source went on to say villagers enlisted the services of police officers from Deet Police Base uh, who accompanied them but were gripped with fear when they opened the businessman's suitcase. They were shocked when they saw strange beings with what they, which they believed were goblins. Hmm. And they were all set running for their dear lives, said a source. Mugwai. <laughs> Bright light, Billy. You think that's what it was, the Mogwai? I think They're so, They're just getting yeah. ready to film the new uh, Gremlins movie? Probably, and they were just mistaken. You know, I mean, they're such cute little guys anyways. You know? The source added that this was not the first time the businessman had been accused of a bizarre incident. Yeah, did he feed him after midnight? Get him wet? <laughs> Most recently, he was seen by villagers digging a grave of a relative of his wife. He fled from the scene, leaving his shoes, which were used as exhibits, and the issue was taken to Chief Nalakuba. And after a full trial, the chief ordered him to leave the area, but he denied vehemently that he was the one who was seen desecrating a grave, said a source. The source added he and the chief should enlist the services of witch hunters, popularly known as Tsi Kamutananaras. Easy for you to say. Not at all. (laughs) Maybe it says Sikamutandas. Sikamutandas. I'm going to go with that. That sounds better. Okay. I think the T is silent in this case. Sikumuntandas to come and sniff out the witch saying if Sikumuntandas can catch someone else, he would take the villagers and chief to task. The source went on to say in fear of the invisible beings, uh, community members now shun his services. The businessman's wife, Bessie Devulu, who works for a safari company, nailed him. I heard that police officers and villagers saw strange things at our homestead when police were investigating a case of dogs which died mysteriously. I will no longer stay with him because he was caught digging a grave of my younger sister. He even ran away and left his shoes at her gravesite. Yeah, that's creepy. Yeah. She added, the issue did not go down well with my parents. The matter was taken to Chief Nelakabuka who after a full trial ordered us to vacate the place, but my husband refused to leave. There is no goblin that they saw. I even advised village head Simiayi, former counselor, my father-in-law and other villagers to enlist the services of Sikomontandos to root out such goblins. I told them that if they fail to root out such invisible things, then they have to give me a beast because that's only fair, Tim. If you're going to, you're going to claim I've got little goblins yeah. and you can't find them. Yeah. And you've besmirched my name. Mm-hmm. I expect you to give me a yak or a, or a water buffalo or, a, a, you know, even a regular buffalo would do. Oh, sure. I mean, I got one right in the backyard here. I'll, mm-hmm. you know, just bring it right over. <laughs> so that's uh, that's weird. The rise of the goblins, Tim. Wouldn't that be the one dark horse we weren't prepared for in our uh, AI versus zombie apocalypse. I was going to say, I think that's the new Star Wars movie that's coming out here in the next year. Rise or two. of the Goblins? Rise of the Goblins, yeah, yeah. Did you hear the rumor that they may reboot the final trilogy, ignoring that what we saw ever took place? I did hear that rumor, yeah. Uh, they're getting, they got rid of Kathleen Kennedy, who's mm-hmm. been a big part of Lucasfilms for years. They're putting a lot of the blame squarely on her shoulders for bad casting, bad choices. And they've talked about 
redoing the last three movies, but doing a totally different set of stories based more along George Lucas's version of what he would have seen. I mean, and people are like excited about it. Do people not recall the prequel trilogy that George Lucas did create that everybody hated? But here's the deal. If, if you take, uh, you know, George, George Lucas needs limiters. You know, he had his ex-wife who was his limiter. You had, uh, was it Erwin Kirshner, who was his his director in, uh, uh, on uh, Empire? Um, he, in, in somewhat of a script writer, you had Carrie Fisher who cleaned stuff up for him at times. He, he, he has to have limiters who can tell him, you know what, George, this sucks, <laughs> um, and, and can clean stuff up for him. Uh, and he needs those limiters, I think, at times. And, and if he does make a return and and whether it be for the original cast or in the original characters or even for something new um he needs limiters and uh you know there are perfectly good people who are involved with the star wars universe now and i'm talking about the people who are doing the mandalorian who could jump in and 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 uh do new Star Wars material uh, with George and be those limiters and, and actually, but how, do you, but how do you just go and erase those three movies? Like, Oh, this, that, that took place in an alternate timeline, but here's the actual story. And unfortunately we've lost Carrie now. Right. And yeah. really it kind of feels like if we can't get a scene where Luke, Han, Leia, Chewie are all together, I just, I know it sounds limited by my, by my short thought on this, but I just feel like, is that even worth examining? I don't know that you can go back and do those, those right. movies again. It's it, time is running short, you know? And, and, uh, you know, if you, I don't know. I, I, um, yeah, I know it's, it's hard to even wrap your head around. Yeah. You digress. Let's get back to, uh, the stories. Uh, the truth is out there, according to this article, article, and Delaware city workers thought maybe they'd stumbled upon a piece of it in the Olentangy River, Tim, which sounds like a delightful drink, doesn't it? It really does. I think the astronauts had that up at, on the moon. Yeah. yeah. Do you want some milk, soda, orange stuff, or Olentangy? Mm. I would sign up for that. Olin Tangy. Mm. Yeah. Two workers in the city's public utilities department who helped lead an August 22nd volunteer cleanup of a river discovered an enormous chunk of metal that resembles the Apollo 11 space capsule or perhaps something else. They joked that it was a UFO and Caroline Sarici, the city's watershed and sustainability coordinator said it took uh, a city backhoe to remove the 880 pound object from the river. The city posted a photo of the mysterious item on the Facebook page, August 31st, and two people quickly identified it as the top from white sands campground. Well, that, that takes away all the excitement right there. White sands owner, Gene Monty said white sands has two tops. So named for the resemblance to a child's spinning top that float in the water flat side up like smaller tops, they can be made to spin when a swimmer climbs aboard. The one pulled from the Olentangy washed away in the May 19th flood. So they, you know, they started off with, oh, it's UFOs. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, no, it's just a, a water top. What a <laughs> disappointment. <laughs> I know our buddy, uh, not our buddy, Scott Waring, said that this was something that was dropped by a UFO. Oh, of course. I mean, you know. <laughs> Sorry, that sounds a little cuckoo to me. Blame aliens. Whenever, uh, whenever you have a chance, blame the aliens because what are they going to do? Come after you? I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Since we're heavily laden into aliens, let's jump right in here. Real aliens? Here are all the scientists arguing that UFOs exist. With the help of social media and even recent announcement, announcements rather, by the U.S. Navy, more than ever, believers are pushing to prove UFOs exist. If fuzzy pictures or government conspiracies aren't enough to convince you, then maybe these scientists can. From documenting key evidence to tightening their arguments, the scientific community is changing the dialogue on UFOs. Here are all the outspoken scientists arguing for the existence of UFOs. Refusing to denounce the recent stockpile of images and testimonials of UFO sightings is the stance of Michael Masters, a biology anthropology professor at the University of Montana. 
In the argument for the existence of UFOs, Masters doesn't think these objects are the vehicle of choice for little green people. Instead, Masters proposed UFOs are driven by humans from the future. Hmm. Masters discussed the theory in his book, Identified Flying Objects, a Multidisciplinary Scientific Approach to the UFO Phenomena. Do, 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 do. Putting stake in the greater proof of UFOs rather than aliens, Masters discussed his theory with Leonard Davis from Space.com. Davis theorized, we know that we've had a long evolutionary history on this planet, and we know our technology is going to be more advanced in the future. I think the simplest explanation innately is that they is us, basically, Tim. They uh-huh. is us. Uh-huh. An astronaut knows aliens are real. Scientist and astronaut Helen Sharman was Britain's first astronaut. Sharman took a trip to the Soviet Mir space station back in 1991 and returned with a conclusive thought. Aliens exist. There's no two ways about it. That's pretty definitive. That is definitive. And you know the old saying, you don't ever squeeze the Sharman. God. Sharman spent eight days working in space as a chemist and researcher. She even believes many of us have had encounters with aliens during our lives and just didn't know it. If perspective from the ground isn't enough to convince you, what about someone who's seen our very civilization from above? In January 2020, Sharman told The Observer, there are so many billions of stars out there in the universe that there must be all sorts of different forms of life. Although Sharman doesn't know if they're carbon-based humans, she even suggested it's possible They're here right now with us. We just can't see them. UFOs exist. They're a serious or worth a serious study. That's what another scientist believe. Those are the beliefs of Kevin Newth, a NASA researcher and assistant professor of physics at the University of Albany in New York. Newth remembered always being interested in UFOs and professed there's plenty of evidence to support UFO sightings. With a firm understanding of the scientific method, Newth admitted studying or testing for UFOs is extremely challenging. The appearance of UFOs can't be repeated, Newt discussed the discrepancy between the uh, expectation that there should be evidence of and the presumption that no visitations have been observed. What Newt described is called the Fermi paradox, spawned by the belief that billions of stars must hold life beyond our our knowledge. Newt also discussed uh, uh, sightings by military governments. He proposed some of the strange flying objects that outperform the best aircraft in our inventory and defy explanation may indeed be visitors from afar. In Kevin Newth's opinion, the biggest issue with the very topic of UFOs, Tim, is its taboo nature in the scientific community. Instead, he turns to the wide array of multiple witnesses, photographic evidence, and patterns of activity. If UFOs and aliens exist... They need to be taken seriously if they're going to be documented with substantial proof. Now, in response to the recent comments on possible UFO existence from the U.S. Navy, Vox spoke to Alexander Wendt, an author and political scientist. Wendt hasn't tried hiding his own frustrations with the scientific community for their underwhelming reaction to new evidence of UFOs and alien life. Wendt specializes in topics related to social science and interpersonal interactions and is intrigued by the unknown something blocking scientists from taking UFOs studies seriously. At a loss, Wendt stated, anything else even remotely this interesting would generate limitless research dollars. In his Vox interview, Wendt acknowledged his true feelings on the significance for such a discovery. Because if ETs were discovered, it would be the most important event in human history. Now, it's hard to argue with the truth in those words, and more than ever, it feels like unwilling scientists are the ones affecting progress, not a lack of UFOs. So I think that's kind of uh, crappy to throw it on the shoulders of scientists, because scientists rely on grant money, governmental money. They may want to, but whoever controls the purse strings may be shutting them down, and you can only do so much on your own. And do you risk your life's work for something that could cause you your career and business. I don't know. Well, that's very true. You you can only go so far based on the resources at hand. So you can only see what you can see based on what you have right. in your hand, like you pointed out. Um, so, you know, to say, well, it's it's up to a scientist to be able to point these things out or find these things for us is kind of, you know, what's the word I want to use here nicely? Uh, BS. Um, you know, uh, 
Yeah, well, and that scientists right. are hiding it. I don't think yeah, that, that's yeah. not the, the nature of science. No, but no. The, scientists may have been given the grants. They may have already found the answers, but they're being stymied because you say something and you lose all the rest of your income. Right. And and they may only have half the answer. They, or you know, Like you pointed out, maybe right. maybe they're they're sitting on half the evidence and they need to go further. But, of course, you need that funding to go further. Um, yeah, they're 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 caught up in a in a bureaucracy that that. You know they they need to acquire further funding or or other tools in order to get the rest of the answer. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know there are there are. Uh, I'm trying to get the words here. Um, you you have a skeptical side to government that doesn't or may not necessarily believe in what you're doing, um, and may cut that funding because they don't think that what you're doing is viable. So, you know, it, it's a it's a catch-22 situation. Our final part of the story says, again, casting aside the theory of green people or Earth destroyers from films, several scientists are aligned with the belief aliens may already be among us. However, unlike cinematic depictions, the creatures just aren't in a form we'd expect or maybe even recognize. Such are the beliefs of uh, Andrew Frackenoy, a member of the board of uh, for the search for extraterrestrial intelligence in Mountain View and former professor of astronomy at Foothill College in California, IA, Tim. Instead of full-size beings, Frackenoy adheres to different popular beliefs amongst some astrobiologists. Aliens may be among us, but arrived in the form of microorganisms. Boring! But that's the most scientifically provable, I, though. I mean, right. you know. Yeah, he said it could. They could come. Well, they could come in all different shapes and sizes, and it's hard to keep track of everything falling to Earth. So that's the long and/or the short of it. Speaking of which, let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We've got more supernatural news to share from all around the world. Right after this. Hi, this is Chris Myers. For more than three decades, I've covered some of the biggest events in sports and talked with some of the most fascinating personalities. But now I want to invite you to join me for my new podcast, CMI, the Chris Myers interview on Podcast One. Covered a lot of events, World Series, Red Sox, White Sox breaking through at their time. The Super Bowl as recently as Mahomes and the Chiefs coming back against the 49ers. I was there to grab Brady after he had that tremendous comeback against the Falcons in the Super Bowl and some tough times. The 89 Earthquake World series that rocked the bay bridge and first to talk to oj simpson live after both of his trials and on the air through the 1996 atlanta olympic bombings informing people as best we could at the time we'll go in depth on stories past present and future to the effect of the world of sports and everybody in and around it from current athletes hall of famers and some people you and i know hope you tune in to cmi the chris myers interview on apple podcast podcast one and spotify Welcome back to the program. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm your host, Dave. That guy over there, that's Tim. We've got more supernatural news to share with you. And here's some uh, here's something, Tim, coming right off of the old science has uh, has a feeling about uh, life elsewhere. Mm -hmm. A scientist spotted water on Mars after claiming NASA has already found aliens. Hmm. The scientist claims he has spotted the water on Mars and believes it further strengthens his claim that NASA has already found signs of alien life on the planet. He theorized that the space agency did not explore the area adequately because it would dampen its plans to send humans there in the 2030s. Dr. D. Gregorio has claimed in his new book, discovery on Vera Rubin Ridge, trace fossils on Mars, that he has identified liquid coming from the same images. He told Daily Star Online, I've enlarged these images using a technique called 3D uh, photogrammetry. Hmm, it's pretty interesting. Boy, they are beautifully detailed. Holy cow. They both show part of a four millimeter size section of the Martian rock NASA has named Haroldswick. If you look closely at the areas I've circled, you can see what happens or what appears to be liquid coming from the severed section and making contact with the host rock. I asked NASA about this, and their explanation is that it must be sand. Clearly, it's not sand. You can see the individual sand grains scattered around the host rock, 
and it has the appearance of some kind of liquid. Hmm. Yet, why did NASA avoid examining it with Curiosity's instruments? Or did they, uh, or are they just keeping this data for themselves? Dr. D. Gregorio has previously speculated that the images could be a sign that soft-bodied creatures once roamed the Red Planet. But Curiosity Science Team member at Imperial College London, Sanjeev Gupta, previously said these can form when salts become concentrated in water, such as in an evaporating lake. And Abigail Freeman, a fellow Curiosity team member, added in a statement, the tiny V-shapes really caught our attention, but they were not at all the reason we went to that rock. We were looking at the color change from one, one area to another, and we were lucky to see the crystals. They're so tiny, you don't see them until you get right up on them. Daily Star Online has approached NASA for a response, and so far, none has been forthcoming, Tim. Hmm. You know, I've always been fascinated with Mars, and I always, uh, I've been fascinated with the theory that Mars at one time had a, a livable atmosphere, and that something had happened with Mars where that li- livable atmosphere had disappeared, and um, the the different uh, evidence that that exists as to why at one time it did have that atmosphere and water being one of them. It, it's it's uh, it's all very fascinating. It's all. When you when you read up on it and you and you look we blew it, it up, Tim. We blew it up. <laughs> you, you think we blew it up? up. <laughs> you blew it up. Um, you know, and, and the different things that would have happened, you know, storms and whatnot that would have uh, eventually caused it to, or or even some sort of collision that might have happened that, or, you know, as far as asteroids that would have caused the atmosphere to disappear um, on Mars. Um, it's all just very interesting stuff, and it makes you think. You know, in how many millions of years something like that, some sort of cataclysmic event could happen like that with Earth? It's uh, it's yeah. kind of scary, but at the same time, uh, it's kind of intriguing as well. Well, here's an intriguing, bizarre story. Uh, fair warning to those of us, our listeners that are a little sensitive towards animals, but this is a mystery that we have to discuss. A series of gruesome horse and pony killings in France have left police baffled and the equine community gripped by fear. Up to 30 incidents have been reported in pastures across the country, including ears being sliced off, eyes removed, genitals cut, sides slashed, and blood being drained. No meat has been taken from the carcasses. Some of the horrific acts could have been ritual mutilations by an unknown cult, while there are other theories about a chilling challenge on social media or copycat crimes. In the majority of attacks, an ear, usually the right one, has been sliced off, echoing matadors taking trophies in a bullring. Agricultural, agriculture minister Julian Denamorande said he was excluding nothing in the investigation and all means are in motion to end this terror. He added, ears are cut off, eyes removed, an animal is emptied of its blood. The crime locations range from the mountain, uh, mountainous Jura region in the east to the Atlantic coast in the west, with many taking place during the summer. A police spokesperson in Paris said, we do not understand the motivation. Is it satanic right, insurance fraud, some macabre trophy hunt, or an internet challenge? We don't know. It's very scary and very traumatizing. There is speculation about how such barbaric acts, some surgical in nature, could be carried out without knowledge of equine anatomy or on a horse that could presumably flee. Veterinarian Audi Giraud, uh, chief of the equine division at the National Veterinary School of Alfred, said a fearful horse in a pasture won't get caught. The horse who feels confident with people, he'll come find it. Normal that you put a harness or a rope around its neck. I'm not sure you need great knowledge of horses to do this. She said an ear can be cut off while the horse is standing, but the animal would need to be prostrate for more grisly mutilations. A man confronted two attackers at his animal refuge last Monday in a village in the bourgogne franche Camus region, Tim. Oh, yeah, of course. Did you get that? I did, yeah. yeah. The bourgogne franche Camus region. The pair fled in a vehicle. Nicholas Demagine, or Demagine suffered an arm injury during a struggle with one intruder who had a knife. The other slashed the sides of two ponies who were traumatized but recovering. He told TV station France 3, I used to have confidence putting my horses out to pasture. Today, I have fear in my guts. The following day, a young pony was targeted in the saint et la region. In another case, 
some of the horse's organs were removed. The president of the French Federation of Equitation has offered to help police investigate the cases. We are all afraid, said Veronique Dupin, <laughs> official at a riding club in the region west of Paris, asking that the exact location of the stable not be identified. So that's bizarre. Very Just much so, yeah. Horses, yeah. But, I mean, if you've seen, if you've already busted two guys doing it, you got to kind of say it's not supernatural. But why? Is it satanic? What what kind of weird rituals are they doing? Uh yeah, it would have to be satanic if it's if it's not aliens, <laughs> or just crazy. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the internet challenge thing is is intriguing to me. The minute you said internet challenge, I'm like, what kind of internet challenge do you put up that that you would do something like that? That I don't know, but there's a lot of dumbass internet challenges, and I'll overhear my kids talking about them sometimes, and then I have to go in and say, ah, no, no, we do not put foreign objects up our butts oh, for video. You know, not that they would do that. I'm just saying, but you know, you hear all of these weird things that they're doing online and they put out these challenges. It's weird. Speaking of weird, Judy Dench, Dame Judy Dench to you and I, Tim says mm-hmm. her late husband, Michael Williams ghost visits her at home. Dame Judy Dench says she will never get over her late husband of 30 years, Michael Williams. And imagines, imagines he occasionally still visits her at their home Dame Judy, who is now dating uh, conservationist David Mills, admits, I suspect I shall never, ever get over Mikey. Speaking about her grief, the 85-year-old continued, it changes who you are altogether, I think, because it's like you're walking along and suddenly you're not looking and there's an enormous chasm in front of you. Unexpected kinds of things happen. Suddenly you'll walk in somewhere and there's a photograph of something. I don't expect you'll ever get used to it. Sometimes the door in his house just opens up, and I think it's that he just wandered back in. Dame Judy and Michael moved into a 17th century house with a six-acre estate in Wasp Green, Surrey, back in 1995, where she now has a tree dedicated to him as part of her memorial forest on the grounds. Asked how long it took her to work out how to be okay with without her husband, Dame Judy responded, I don't know, perhaps I've never done that quite yet. Now, both actors, the couple starred together in the 1980s sitcom A Fine Romance, as well as in several stage productions after first meeting in a pub on Drury Lane, where they both worked for the Royal Shakespeare Company. They also both appeared in a 1999 Franco Zeffirelli film, Tea with Mussolini. Michael would frequently say his talents did not match his wife's, though he said, I never feel inferior as a person, and there are some things I can do a damn straight better than Jude can. Speaking about their happy union, which she says was down to luck, Dame Judy describes, I don't think we ever had to work at it. I mean, sometimes Mikey used to have black dog days sometimes, but he was the most unselfish man, and he would never, ever attribute that to anything that might be between us. Oh, God, how we used to make each other laugh. We used to make, he used to make me absolutely howl. We had a lovely time. It was never a tricky time. I was very lucky to meet Mike. Dame Judy recalls how Michael flew out to Australia while she was performing with the Royal Shakespeare Company and her friend Charlie Thomas passed away. We are all in a very, very bad way, says uh, Dame Judy. Mike got a plane and flew out to see us all. It was a saving grace, really. Then he said, will you marry me? And I said, will you please ask me on a rainy day in Battersea? Then it would feel real. So that's what happened. So it's a sweet story. But um, Shortly before Michael's death, I guess the couple's only child, daughter Finty Williams, now 47, and her son, 23-year-old Sam, moved in, along with various animals, including, as actress Flinty described, a dog, six cats, two goldfish, ducks, and more hens, and a hamster named Biscuit. Aww. Dame Judy met her partner, David, in 2010 when she opened the Red Squirrel Enclosure at the British Wildlife Center, which he runs near her home. She refers to him as my chap, rather than her boyfriend. He's about four miles away, Dame Judy said, and that's just lovely because we laugh about the same things. Dame Judy described how she loathes being called a national treasure, telling David Tennant's podcast that the phrase reminds her of something very, very dusty behind a glass in a corner. (laughs) I I don't want to be a relic, she says. The actress is adamant she will never retire, but says, my eyesight is so bad now. That's quite tricky. I have ways of new ways of learning things. As long as I've got enough time to prepare, I've got great friends who help me with lines and things. So that's pretty cool. Uh, her, her passed away husband still comes to visit Dame Judy Dench. Who wouldn't? 
Well, yeah. She's a national treasure. Uh, she's great. <laughs> she's a national treasure. And she'll absolutely beat you about the head and shoulders when you call her that. Um, I shall beat you about your head and shoulders if I could see you. You know, it, it, uh, it's... It, I got to ask you this question, and it's kind of a personal question. But you know, when you when you look at that relationship with Dame Judy Dench and her chap, as she put it, uh, do you believe now, whether it be you going before Winnie or Winnie going before you, do you think that uh, you would you would come back and uh, visit Winnie, or Winnie would come back and visit you if if one went before the other? I would hope so. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know. Like I said, you know, I waited f- for so long for my mom to make some kind of um, contact after her death. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that I ever, you know, it sounds so contradictory. I don't know that I ever felt that. I mean, I've had weird things happen that I think mom might have had a hand in. And it's pretty hard to dismiss, right? Right. Strange things falling into place. But I've never seen her it's not like i've ever felt the door shut or you know heard her voice or anything i just so i I haven't had that connection again and that's a little bothersome to me um would i want to sure i would want to come back i've already told my wife and my kids and friends and family i will be back to haunt them and have fun doing so but uh, yeah I, i mean i'd like to i'd like to uh stay around i guess i don't know you know my fear would be is that i'd lose the light and i wouldn't know how to get back and then i'd be trapped walking the earth for eternity well you know there's that we had marianne winkowski on years and years ago and she always used to contend that that light is is you know at every funeral home or that light is in multiple places and you can always jump back into that light that light is never lost um which i always found fascinating that you know that that you can always find that light should you need it. Um, that if you're constantly looking for that light, that that light's never lost. It's when you lose track of yourself that that light is lost. Um, or you lose track of, you know, the reason why, you know, the the reason, I shouldn't say the reason why you're, you're um, the reason why you've passed or the reason, you know, it, it, it's almost like when you've tied yourself to the earth you, or you've tied yourself to earthly reasons, you've tied yourself to the earth, if that makes sense. Um, it, it's almost like the minute that you realize you're gone, that light appears. Um, and it, it's almost like that's the lesson that she put out there that those many years ago when we talked to her. Um so it's almost like if, as long as you keep the perspective that, you know what, I have passed, it almost seems like you, you get that ability to jump between realms. Um, I, I, I hope. I don't know. I, it'll be, you know, I, I'm not in any rush to find out, but I will oh, I'm not the, mortality, the yeah. mortality of life is banging on me constantly. It's really weird. I'm not... Uh, my fear of death, not quite the same after my journey, mm-hmm. but uh, it's still hard. You know, you sit there, you, dude, 53 years in the blink of an eye. This year, which has been a horse crap year yeah. for yeah. many reasons, there's been some great things that have happened. You know, I found my my biological father in 2020. I found my remarkable sisters and brothers in 2020. Mm-hmm. That's great. And with as labor uh, laborious, I should say, as this year has been, it went by way too fast, which yeah. I guess is good. And I've often wondered, is it all of us? I think we mentioned this on the episode with Caroline Corey, all of us focused on just wanting to get through 2020 that's making this year and time irrelevant. That may be. I think uh, people are, you know, Art Bell talked about the quickening. I think, uh, I think in times of extreme strife, I think when people focus on wanting to get through something quickly, I think time speeds up. I think you're right. I think when, when people are in extreme agony in extreme and not only physical, but emotional strife, I think time does tend to speed up a little bit. Yeah, and it's weird. And, and there is, I think a, a, a collective um, quickening when, when people are, are in that strife. Let me let me drop this little time bomb on you, Tim. Okay. This month 
marks the fifth anniversary of the passing of two of our friends, the Constantinos. Yeah. Five years yeah. has gone by in what seems like a few months, you know? My mm-hmm. mom will be gone four years this year. But five years. I mean, I I remember I was on a foreign trip with, with our listeners, and I got the message um, from Sharon Leong, who has since passed on as well, a good friend of our show and, and events, and that um, Mark Constantino had murdered his wife and then himself uh, in his daughter's apartment. And it's still surreal to me that that happened. But for five years to have passed already, I, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. I've been processing archives, and I, I almost forgot the timber and pitch and the way Mark's voice delivered when he did interviews. And I ran across an old interview from uh, one of the first interviews, just with Mark, not with Debbie, but just with Mark. And I sat and I listened to it for about 20 minutes, just without processing the interview, without you know doing any audio processing or editing or anything like that, just to listen to the the audio quality, the the timber of his voice, the just to remember, you know, how you just file something into your memory. You how right. you don't want to lose something like that because I had started to forget. I did that too with with uh, Father Andy Calder. Um, I just started to file it away in my memory again because I didn't want to forget. And it's, and you think about how how long Andy's been gone too. Um, you know, you do yeah. that at times. You know, it's it's nice that we have those those records around that we can go back and listen to that stuff. But but yeah, it, um, it time does go too quickly. Way too fast. Way too fast. Um, five years. Wow. All right, let's uh, let's wrap it up. We got a couple uh, stories left to cover this week. We're covering our supernatural news this week, I should say. Next week it'll be all parish share. Uh, we're going to alternate that this uh, this coming two weeks. So um, there's also other great, great changes coming, folks. We have uh, been talking about this for a while, and Tim, I think it's time to just put the the cards on the table. Mm-hmm. Our show is leaving Podcast One. And we will be joining over at uh, Midroll is our new home. And Midroll will make our show available through many different streaming devices or capabilities. And Tim, could you kind of outline that for the listeners real quick, how they'll be able to find us and and what's going to be going on with that? Sure. Well, Midroll is also the parent company of Stitcher. You're familiar with Stitcher and uh, will be available at Apple Podcasts, of course, at Spotify, a lot of the different... um, a lot of the different streaming options and and uh, download options that you get your um, where you normally listen to your podcasts, um, but it's open to so many more listening uh, formats that you normally listen to your your podcasts. You'd be amazed as to where you can get our podcasts, uh, including Stitcher, um, and uh, so you're you're open to so many more formats. Um, not only that, but uh, the uh, the opportunities that you'll get as well um, through uh, Stitcher and uh, and um, Midroll are, are going to be uh, phenomenal. Uh, we're also going to be migrating True Crime Tuesday over to Stitcher Premium. So that's and this is big, folks. This is big. True Crime Tuesday. If you've been following our show. Um, when we moved to podcast one, they didn't want us to bring the true crime element. So they uh, migrated our show over to, to um, Patreon, which has been a raging pain in the ass for many of you. And we understand the problems. That's why we've been trying to find something. And Tim connected us with mid roll and has negotiated this uh, new transition and everything for us uh, so that we could deliver the shows in a better way. Right now, you've been paying $5 a month to just access our show at uh, true crime Tuesday. We're going to be moving over to the new stitcher premium and my understanding again, Tim, is that same price is going to get them access to all of the Stitcher Premium programs. That's right. You'll get access to every single Stitcher Premium program that's out there for that five dollars a month. Uh, plus, you get True Crime Tuesday and, and all the archives for True Crime Tuesday. 
Well, but we ask to hold off. Don't sign up quite yet. Right. Keep checking Darkness Radio and listening to this show for when we should ask you to migrate over because we want to make sure that it is attributed to us so they can see the force of people that are going to come over and join. So if you have not joined Stitcher Premium yet, please hold on until then. Now, another thing to mention. If you are uh, going to find our show and it is not up at podcast one, you can go to darknessradio.com, find our YouTube page where we'll continue to put the show up for a few more weeks on YouTube, uh, our YouTube page, and then everything will be migrating over. But Tim, can you explain for listeners that follow us how, how big of a transition, especially those that are on our um, podcast tool, Darkness Radio, will it just switch over and they'll just continue listening to it the same way? Yep, we're on the exact same RSS feed, uh, if, if you're familiar with anything technical. So essentially, it's like being on the same radio station. Um, you're, we'll be on the exact same RSS feed, uh, both with True Crime Tuesday and with um, with uh, Darkness Radio, Beyond the Darkness. It, nothing changes. We, we stay on the exact same feed so nothing will change with your subscription, hopefully. So uh, if you if you do drop, just look for the same subscription again. Um, the logo will change, so you won't see the Beyond the Darkness logo. You won't see the little ghost with the microphone. We'll go right. we'll go back to the old Darkness Radio logo. So that's why you've been hearing the the Scully. theme. Yep, you'll right. see Scully again. That's why you've been hearing the old theme. Uh, that's why you've been hearing everything that way. So. Uh, we're going back to the old Darkness Radio name uh, because back in the day when we were with iHeart, you heard uh, you heard Darkness Radio. We're reestablishing ourselves as Darkness Radio again. So that's right. Yeah, which we've never really strayed from. No, it's always no. been Darkness Radio presents. But uh, yeah, we're we're just going right back to it. Um, you know, our our little ghosty uh, logo has always been a good friend to us, and you know, uh, he'll still pop up here and there. But uh, we're going back to Scully and the Darkness Radio that you've known and loved for, believe it or not, fifteen years. Fifteen years, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Speaking of time going fast. <laughs> yeah. It, it's nuts. It really is. And I think of how many things have changed. I mean, you know, my daughter um, was born the year that, uh, you know, not the year that we launched this show, but I mean, you know, she, she's grown up with this show. Uh, well, two of my daughters have, but it's just, it's so strange to think 15 years. Huh. Anyway, I digress. Let's, uh, let's get back to it because we've got a, a handful of stories to wrap up with. Hey, all of you in Ontario. That's Canada, Tim. Oh, yeah. For those of yeah. you that aren't familiar. Right in your Texas. If you're a, yeah. yeah. If you're a fan of ghost stories, it might be time to make some extra cash. That's right. The Haunted Walk, an Ontario tour company specializing in the paranormal, is hiring tour guides in cities across the province. So if you love supplying the spooks, these Ontario ghost walks are a perfect place to work. According to the Haunted Walk, anyone who is hired to be a tour guide typically works three to five short shifts a week. The job altogether not super seasonal offers the most work and pay during October. So if you're all booked up for Halloween, you might want to wait until next year. The job listing calls for a flair for the dramatic and bilingualism. Tim, yeah, did you get it. that? Bilingualism. Easy for you to say. Yeah. yeah. That means that you can speak multi-languages mm -hmm. or at least two. That's the by part, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is definitely a significant asset when applying for the position. However, you aren't technically required to have anything other than a high school diploma. Perhaps the best part of the job besides getting to spook folks is that its application process has been made super, super simple. No resumes or cover letters are required. All you have to do is submit a brief online form and you're done. Tour guides are the heart and soul of the haunted walk. They breathe life into the stories and make certain that every one of our customers goes home satisfied. If not, a little scared. A statement from the company reads, according to the website, the company is currently hiring in cities such as Kingston, Toronto, and Ottawa. Now, if being a tour guide doesn't sound appealing to you, but you're big on Halloween, you could always check out one of the many other places in Ontario currently hiring for seasonal work. But if you're looking to be a tour guide storyteller, which would be amazing, um, I mean, look, dude, why should you apply? You get a chance to hold a lantern tell spooky stories, and tour Canadian history. What more could you want? What more? I ask thee. T Twinkies. Yeah, well, there's that too. Yeah. All right. Uh, the mystery of the ghostly monk of St. Mary's Guildhall who photobombed Freemasons 
How about that story? Coventry is steeped in history. And with that comes a fair share of paranormal baggage. One of the city's oldest sites, the medieval St. Mary's Guildhall, has been a landmark in Coventry since around 1340. In its heyday, it was the richest merchant guild in the city and played a key role in civic life. Members of the guild included wealthy traders, but also the kings Henry V, 4th, or I'm sorry, 5th, 6th, and 7th. That's... That's what all those little numbers mean to my mind was trying to reprocess V, V, I, and V, I, I. Yeah. yeah. Fifth, sixth, and seventh. Later, Mary, Queen of Scots, would spend part of her imprisonment in Coventry at the Guildhall, leading to some suggestions. See, she is one of the many ghostly apparitions said to have been seen over the centuries. Throughout the building, many strange phenomena doo, 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 have been reported, from ghostly chanting to stones being thrown at visitors and floating orbs of light that can be seen with the naked eye. But one of the most persistent sightings is that of a ghostly monk. And a photograph from a fancy dinner in 1985 caught the attention of ghost hunters the world over. On January 22nd of 1985, a civic dinner for the Coventry Freemasons was held in the Great Hall at the Guild Hall. As is customary, prayers were said before the meal and a photographer, a photographer, Tim. A photographer. One of the photographers captured the moment. But when the picture was developed... It had captured the chilling image of a robed figure standing at the end of a table near the famous Coventry Tapestry. Nobody present saw the figure during prayers, and nobody at the dinners was dressed in such a way. The photographer didn't see it as they captured the shot earlier, but the room was dark and the picture is captured using a long exposure. So could the image be a trick of light or perhaps a hoax played while din- diners had their heads bowed and eyes possibly closed? Nobody has ever been able to provide a definitive answer to explain the robed figures presence. And after 35 years, it's unlikely that anyone ever will. So the question is, was the monk ever captured on camera again? Well, the monk may have been captured again near the Coventry Tapestry in more recent times. During a visit to the site in 2014, Irish President Michael Higgins gave a speech at the Guild Hall and was photographed by a Coventry Telegraph photographer. When the picture was examined later, a floating emerald mass had appeared in the shot behind the Prime Minister. It hadn't been seen while uh, photographer Joe took the shot. He later said, I was a little taken aback, to say the least. Some in the office are convinced it's a ghost, but I'm not so sure. However, I am surprised. I didn't spot it at the time, so who knows? Was the monk again captured, lingering near the tapestry yet a second time? It's pretty interesting. Uh, The the green, misty apparition, I don't know so much about, but the monk image is extremely detailed, and it looks tall. Hmm. Really tall. So, so it, crazy. The ghost is in different dress than everybody at the banquet hall. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Interesting. Yeah. You can spend a night ghost hunting at a haunted old hospital and an orphanage. That's what this claim is coming from. I also want to mention, for all of our friends in Texas, Tim, mm-hmm. uh, the Dr. Pepper factory in, in uh, Texas, Waco, Texas, is giving haunted tours i guess the dr pepper plant is haunted really because you're a pepper i'm a pepper he's a pepper she's a pepper wouldn't a ghost want to be a pepper too tim you would think so yeah yeah so that's what's going on i I wanted to mention that uh so if you're in waco they're taking people in increments of 10 at a time to do the walking ghost tour of the dr pepper plant now we'll go back to this story a company is offering fans of the paranormal a chance to spend the night hunting for ghosts in an abandoned building that was previously used as an orphanage and a hospital. So if you love all things spooky and have a keen interest in the supernatural, we've got the place for you. Have you ever wanted to experience what it's like to spend the night in a potentially haunted building? If you answered yes, then I think Tim and I have found the perfect opportunity for you. A company named Haunted Happenings are offering people the chance to spend the night ghost hunting at Newsham Park Hospital in Liverpool. You can come on out, Tim, and check out the Liverpudlian ghosts. According to the company, the Grade 2 listed building dates back to Victorian times, and over the years it's been used as many different things, including an orphanage, psychiatric hospital, and a nursing home. Haunted Happenings website says, Newsham Asylum is the ultimate ghost hunt location for those wishing to spend the night in a frightening and very active building. This orphanage-turned-hospital dates back to the Victorian era, John. 
where punishments were harsh and cruel, and the sprawling building now lies empty and abandoned with a sinister and frightening feel to it. Boarded up and surrounded by perimeter fencing, haunted happenings have 99,000 square feet of terrifying corridors and rooms to explore as we enter this building in search of the ghostly inhabitants that still reside there. They state that areas of interest to explore include the Psych Cinema, the infamously Naughty Boys Corridor, and the Morgue. If this wasn't enough, there's also a schoolhouse, hospital wards, nurse accommodation, a bell tower, and a chapel to investigate. Haunted Happenings adds this that there is an instant feeling of uneasiness as you enter and begin your journey into the frightening location. On a Haunted Happenings overnight ghost hunt at Newsham Hospital, you will not fail to sense the torment of those who belong to its long and torrid history. Wheelchairs sit empty in the corridors, and the mortuary fridges exist as a cold reminder of the lives that pass through this place, giving the location a unique and a terrifying atmosphere. During our overnight ghost hunts, here there have been numerous reports of paranormal activity. Distant voices have been heard from within the empty building. Shadowy figures have been seen darting down the stairwells. A number of ghost hunting nights have been scheduled since uh, between uh, September and into next year, with spaces booking up quickly. The Newsham Park abandoned Asylum and Orphanage Ghost Hunt runs between 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. and costs between $65 and $69 per person, which seems like a pretty good price for, what is that, five, six hours? Yeah, that's not bad. Seven hours worth of time there. Yeah. 69 bucks. I'd do it. Yeah. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, that's for sure. All right, our final story is here, Tim. Okay. A new documentary follows the 30-year cosmic quest by U.S. space enthusiast John Shepard. What drove him to beam messages and music from Cannes to Coltrane into space? Well, in the mid-1960s, when he was a boy living in rural Michigan, John Shepard began thinking of ways to make contact with alien life forms. It was around about that time that a show called The Outer Limits was on television, he recalls. I remember being fascinated by the idea of somehow building my own scientific instruments to explore the mysterious phenomenon that is extraterrestrial life. In 72, from the living room of his grandparents' house, he began chasing his dream by broadcasting a series of electronic tone pulses towards the stars. So began an extraordinary 30-year journey he called Project Strat, Special Telemetry Research and Tracking. It would soon take over his life and the lives of his grandparents who found themselves living amid an expanding array of what he calls beautiful and unusual instruments, including a dual-channel oscillators, cathode ray tubes, giant screens to monitor incoming signals, and low-frequency transmitter sending signals millions of miles into deep space. Here's a thought. If we've got a guy on our planet shooting, beaming messages and signals into space, Tim, Mm -hmm. maybe some of these signals that we're getting bounced back, you know, that that they keep picking up, what if they're this guy's signals bouncing back? Hmm. Because if this guy's able to go millions of miles into space and it deflects off something and bounces back towards us, maybe that's why we're getting this cyclical cycle, because it's actually coming from right here on Earth. I wonder if anybody's looked into that. That's a, that's a pretty good theory. I mean, a, a lot of times when, I mean, let's face it, a lot of times when you send a signal and uh, there is a, a, a huge potential for bounce back and, and getting your own signal back at you, um, especially a, a signal like that. I, this focused of a signal. Yeah, I exactly. Would, this would hold some of its integrity, come back, maybe not be clear enough for them to define what it is. But yeah. they're picking up on remnants or refractions of that signal. Yeah, Just a, something to consider. That's yeah, a good possibility. Yeah. Though he had little money, he trawled military surplus sales and wholesales electrical warehouse in nearby Traverse City, collecting the materials he needed in the garden. He erected a two-story, 150,000-volt output stage mounted on a pair of tall metal towers made from salvage that included a dismantled ski lift. In the living room, scientific equipment was arranged floor to ceiling along one wall. Often, people passing by the night in their cars would see a bank of lights blinking in the living room, and they'd pull over to stop and stare, he says. Maybe they had been watching The Outer Limits, too. And they were wondering what was going on. I remember some people even thought we had built a Russian spy system. Well, last Thursday, Netflix premiered an intriguing short film called John Was Trying to Contact Aliens which earlier this year won the prize for Best Documentary Short at the Sundance Sundance Film Festival. Shot, edited, and directed by Matthew Killip, son of a revered British documentary photographer, Chris Killip, it distills Shepard's 30-year quest into just 16 magical minutes. I wanted to tell his story economically and sparely 
While keeping some of the mystery intact, said Killip, John is a wonderful subject, but there is something mysterious and guarded about him that may stem from his troubled early life. I try to balance that narrative with his extra, extraordinary obsession, which lies somewhere between the realms of science and out, uh, outsider art. The more I thought about what he did, the more it seemed like an elaborate 30-year art performance. In the 70s, Shepard's obsession intermittently drew local reporters to his door. In 1989, he was even granted his 15 minutes of nationwide fame with an appearance on the Joan Rivers show. On YouTube, you can see him squeeze between two other ufologists, an intense young man with long hair and a beard explaining his mission to his somewhat spe- skeptical host, who points out that after 16 years, the ETs have still not returned his calls. By then, with the help of his grandmother's Irene's life savings, Shepard had constructed a spacious two-story laboratory next to his grandparents' house. While my body was in the local community, he tells Killip, my mind was in space and in other realms, traveling the cosmos, flickering home movie footage from that time reveals a futuristic interior filled with screens, consoles, and arrays of beeping lights. The Starship Enterprise transposed to a small town in Michigan. Using a giant transmitter in the front garden, he began beaming music into space for several hours a day from the likes of Sun Ra, Ornette Coleman, and John Coltrane, alongside German experimentalists such as Can, Cluster, and Harmonia. But not get to the chopper, Tim. No. That's... Come with me, get to the chopper! <laughs> who, who does that? What? It's like That's... German death metal, right? Uh, I'm trying to remember. That wasn't Rammstein. That was... Um... Yeah, I can't remember either. Yeah, I don't remember. Anyway, at one point, we see the young shepherd leaning intently into the microphone and announcing to the cosmos, now we're now, we're now going to bring you some Afro pop to warm up your evening. Killip first began and became aware of Shepard when he was perusing a book about UFO cults and saw a photograph of a long-haired young man surrounded by banks of machinery with his grandma sitting beside him knitting. Between working at his day job as a film editor for the likes of artist Jeremy Deller, Killip had made a short film called Master of Reality about another American teenager outsider, Ronnie Long, whose obsessions included wrestling and horror movies. There were certain similarities in terms of their extreme single-mindedness, he says. In Killip's tenderly preserved portrait, Shepard's, Shepard emerges as a sensitive soul aware of his otherness and yet at one with it. The narrative touches briefly on his troubled childhood a father who left soon after he was born and an emotionally distant mother with whom he had very little contact. Things were rough in the early years, he tells Killip. My grandma felt sorry for me and took me with her. At 12, Shepard realized he was gay, which he says is his inimitably understandable way proved rather difficult in rural Michigan back in the 1960s. I think if you have a troubled early life, it does make for a more explorative journey, he tells the matter uh, tells me matter-of-factly. It certainly made me an independent way and encouraged me to expand my horizons. Most of what I did was self-taught, but my grandfather, who had worked as a toolmaker in Detroit, helped me with the often very precise practical stuff. It was my grandmother, though, who shared my interest in, how shall I put it, more exotic subjects. She definitely had a feeling for it, and she brought a lot of inspiration into my life. Irene died in 1988, and the film is dedicated to her. In a moment poignant of self-reflection in the film, Shepard compares his life's journey to a trek along a lonely mountain road that changed when he met his life partner, John Latrenta, in 1993. They live, he says, a quiet life on a lakefront house between two small towns. In 98, due to lack of funds, Shepard reluctantly dismantled his lab and put everything in storage where it remains. He guides Gillip through the jumbled space with a flashlight, pointing out his beloved machinery, satellite communication equipment, high-powered microwave tubes, a high-voltage transmitter accelerator. These are just the remnants, he says, the leftover pieces of thought. I miss it, he tells me. I really do, but I saved it all. It's like a collection of beautiful objects waiting. In the film, he describes his long, strange creative endeavor as a kind of dream state that imbued his life with meaning. And on the clip from The River Show, when he she mentions his lack of success, he replies, Like an artist can continue to paint even if he doesn't sell his paintings. I continue to build equipment and work on ideas. Does he think in retrospect that he is a conceptual artist as much as a scientist? I guess so, he says quietly. An artist of sound and light and electricity and a maverick, definitely a maverick. That would be a pretty good description. 
That's pretty cool. So you could see the very short documentary, John Was Trying to Contact Aliens. It is on Netflix. So go check that out for yourself. That's it for this week. Remember, big changes abound, my friends, and we hope that you'll come along with us and continue your journey into the darkness on the edge of town with Dave and Tim as we continue now with Midroll, and that'll be happening here very soon in our changeover. Thank you again for tuning into our program. We will be back tomorrow, and Tim, mm-hmm. we've got a really cool show. We've talked about Salem and the witch trials, but earlier this year, I found that Salem has many other secrets to share. So tomorrow, Salem Secrets. And we're going to find out about all of these other strange and unusual and fascinating tales. Oh, sure, we're going to talk talk a little bit about the witch trials, but some of the angles I didn't know about. Mm. And we're going to talk about other aspects of Salem that are even more chilling. So make sure you tune in tomorrow to the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm Dave. That's Tim. This is Darkness Radio. Darkness Radio.